because because Jesus is here anything is possible in atmospheres like this cancer can suddenly just disappear from your body blind eyes can open deaf ears can snap open because the gift of faith is marvelously in this place here this morning once again there are many things that I could preach to you I could let go of this right now and we could just have a great altar service and pray one for another but there are many things I could preach but I just feel to talk to you I have had the Holy Ghost now for 54 years And I've seen through the years some of the most incredible things that I've never preached or told because I wasn't sure people would believe it. But at this point, I don't care if you believe it or not. You need to hear it. And I am totally convinced that we have not even scratched the surface of what belongs to us in the real realm of the Spirit of God. And so today, I'm just going to tell you things I've never told before. As a point of reference, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29 and verse 29, this is a powerful statement made by Moses. He said... Deuteronomy 29 and 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. Then in Psalm 105, verse 1, Powerful admonition here. It simply says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known. That means to tell. Make known his deeds among the people. This Bible is only a recording of God's deeds among his people from the beginning all the way through to the end. And then as a final portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And I've heard it preached and referred to and taught with, in reference to this verse many times. And they just stop there, leaving you in some kind of a th ethereal, gossamer, far out, supernatural, spiritual realm. But the next verse says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And here it is. For what man knoweth the things of a man, but the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Lift your hands, your voices, and ask God to let revelation, understanding come up on you. And that you will never be the same after this closing session today. Just let your voice out. Don't worry about your neighbor hearing. Lord Jesus, by the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus, 
I'm asking for the authority of God, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, by your great authority, let revelation purge Oloharaka, our hearts, our minds, our souls, become explosive inside of us, that we will see with eyes of the Spirit. Help us to enter into the realm of the supernatural. God, there is hunger and thirst in this place today. Let the water of life flow freely, your anointing upon us both to hear and to speak. We will not fail to give you praise, glory, and honor. We ask these things in the matchless resplendent or powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and everyone shouted amen you may go down clapping one more time would you clap your hands all ye people and would you just shout with a voice of victory and triumph When the nation sends its soldiers out to war, they are armed with the greatest ammunition, the best that the government has in order to defeat the enemy. We are soldiers of the cross. God has sent us into this world to conquer and to destroy the enemy. God has given us the greatest weapons, the most irrefutable forces of his spirit to absolutely sabotage and destroy and utterly annihilate the forces of darkness in this world. In the 54 years I've had the Holy Ghost, I've seen some incredible things, some amazing things that have changed my life forever. These things are the reason I am who I am and what I have become in God. <clears throat> I graduated from Bible college in 1967 and I ended up in upstate New York and I'm still there. When I came into this it was just a tremendous change in my life. And as a believer, you try to live in this world and do what you can and negotiate what comes down the path of your life. But once you get the Holy Ghost, everything else becomes strangely dim. It just fades away. I am a life member with NRA, so I, I enjoy hunting and all that type of thing. I grew up in a farm in Iowa and we lived on wild game a lot, so I know a lot about that. But I'm saying that to say this, in my backyard where I live right now, I live at the end of a cul-de-sac in a forest. I've counted as many as 12 deer in my backyard, white-tailed deer. I can understand something about them because I can watch them, I can observe, and I can also read books about others who have studied them. But I will never ever really be able to understand a white-tailed deer because I don't have the spirit of a deer. I have the spirit of a man. I have watched eagles in upstate New York where I used to camp in the wilds way up there. I can understand something about them by observing them and, and I enjoy watching them. But I'll never ever really be able to understand an eagle because I don't have the spirit of an eagle. I have the spirit of a man. 
I can watch bears. We have black bears in the forest right now behind my house where I live. I can understand something about them by observing them and by, again, reading what others have observed, watching them, etc. But I'll never understand a black bear because I don't have the spirit of a bear. I have the spirit of a man. That's why when you cry, I can cry with you. That's why when you're happy and you laugh, I can laugh with you. When you become angry, I can feel and I can relate to that. But when this man in us, this humanity, receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not only do you understand the things of man, you begin to understand the things of God. And it separates you, totally separates you for all time. We make no sense to this world out there at all, but we're not trying to make sense to them. And we really don't care what they think. That's why we clap, that's why we shout, that's why we dance, that's why we run. That's why we come to church 10 times a week. <clears throat> so much talk about addiction and all of that nonsense with drugs in the world. I want to tell you something. I'm an addict. I'm a mainliner. I am addicted to Jesus. That's why we were here last night till probably midnight and we're still here back again this morning. You know why? We have come for another fix. That's why we're here again. Because you can't get enough of this. If you're really addicted to this, if you've really got a hold of God, you don't think dancing is strange. You don't think running is strange. You don't think shouting is strange. You can pick You can pick You can it's the power of God inside of us. And I want to tell you something. No matter what they think out there, if he likes clapping, we're going to clap. If he likes jumping, we're going to jump. If he likes dancing, we're going to dance. We're going to sing. We're going to shout. We're going to worship God. Because he is worthy of our praise. You'll never dance enough. You'll never shout enough. You'll never run enough. You'll never sing enough to thank him for even one drop of blood. So one more time, give him a standing ovation. Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto the Lord. When I first got out of Bible school, I ended up in upstate New York, and I ended up pastoring a small church on Webster Street in Schenectady, New York. <clears throat> Every morning, when I first started pastoring there, I would get up, put on my suit, white shirt, I would go to the church and I would, in the wee hours of the morning, lay on my face on the carpet and cry and pray and ask God to use me. Yes. I'm still doing it. I still do it. I'm still asking God to use me. Yes. But the thing you have to be very careful about when you ask God to use you you may end up feeling you've been used. But that's exactly what you ask for. <laughs> and your schooling will be different than mine, etc. But in those months that I prayed like that, 
you can't pray and God not hear. Prayer is the hand of the soul that reaches out to God and never returns empty. God began to hear my prayers. It was amazing. I began to see things. I began to understand things. And we had some powerful services. We tore with high school upside down. I won kids out of that school. It was amazing. I took an ex-drug addict to the high school. They wanted me to come and speak to the students. I did. And what happened was, I took Tommy with me. He'd been an LSD addict. He was really a, into drugs. And I had got, I'd won him to God, his whole family. And so when they asked me to come, I took him with me. And they put us in this room with all these students, you know, in the drama department. And here we were, <clears throat> and I walked up front and I said, um, young people, I said, I'm really glad to be here, but I brought a young person with me that wants to tell you something. And he came up front and told his story about being converted and delivered from drugs. The power of God came in that place. He was absolutely anointed and the Holy Ghost fell. So I said, Young people, I want you to do something for me. I said, I want all of you to lift your hands like this. Every one of those students lifted their hands like this. I said, I want you to close your eyes and begin to worship God by saying hallelujah. The whole class had their hands in the air, worshiping God by saying hallelujah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can't do that and God not be attracted to you. He will come like a magnet. The Holy Ghost fell in that classroom. There was a girl in front of me that fell out on the floor receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. Her boyfriend was scared to death. I took a hold of him. I said, look, boy, it's all right. She just received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Those kids were making so much noise. The teachers came down the hall, saw what was going on, and locked us in there. They didn't want that to get out in the hallways. People, you know what the thing is right now? They're trying to lock us in. They don't want us to get into the streets. They don't want us to get into the highways and the by way they don't want us to get out there because if you ever get close to this you will get burned by the fire you will get burned by the fire I would to God that what I've seen here last night in these services was on the streets downtown in this area. You know what would happen? A crowd would gather. A big crowd would gather. And when they gathered, they would come to mock and to scoff. But when they got too close to the fire, they would the fire would get a hold of them. Because people, if you ever get what I've got a hold of, you're going to act just like us. You're going to act just like me. Because it's like a fire shut up in your bones. It's like a fire shut up inside of you. You cannot contain this. You cannot contain it. There's nothing out there that can compare with this. You're right. There's nothing out there that can compare with this. This is the greatest thing that will ever happen to you. So people, if you've got what I'm talking about right now for just a moment, demonstrate it. Just demonstrate it. Do whatever you feel like doing. We had an absolute great revival. We had a move of God. And what happened was, we, I pitched a tent, and we, it was an old dilapidated tent. We were home missionaries. We didn't have any money, big rips in it, and all that type of thing. So all we had, we had sawdust for an altar area in the front. Out there in the middle of the area, there were, there were seven Roman Catholic churches in that Mount Pleasant area. I pitched a tent right in the middle of them. And began to preach this gospel. It caused no little stir. I mean, all kinds of things happen. <laughs> One night, there's a couple of thugs out there, <clears throat> and they thought, they made their brags out there, they were going to come down that little sawdust aisle there, and they were going to just do me in at the end of the, that service. They were out there bragging about it. So, 
one of these guys, he came in strutting down there, and I just stood there. He got about right there, and his friends are watching because he's going to come in here and wipe me out. See, he's right here. His, literally, I'm not exaggerating, his knees began to go like this. I didn't know what happened, but he saw a tall white angel standing behind me. He turned and ran out of there. People, I may look like I am alone, but I am not alone. You are not alone because the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. I am never alone. You are never alone. In St. Louis, Missouri, years ago, when I first came into this, there were two of our beautiful girls walking down the street somewhere there in St. Louis. And some of the couple of thugs came out of the, the shadows and the alleys. They were going to do whatever. And they came up on those girls and began to try to do what their, th their thing they thought they were going to do. And the Holy Ghost hit those two girls and they began to jump and shout and dance and speak with tongue. Those two thugs run like rats in a rainstorm. I mean, they took off. Girls, you're never alone. You don't have to back down to anything. You don't have to because you've got the power inside of you to tear up everything. And there's nothing out there that can do it. There is nothing out there greater than what is inside of you. It is written, greater, greater, greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. That greater has a name. His name is Jesus. Shout the name of Jesus for just a moment. Mm. So, in that atmosphere, that tent revival, the chief of police downtown Schenectady sent a message to me to come to his office because the neighbors had complained. We're making too much noise. They don't seem to care about a disco band out there. But, but with us, it's different. And it is different. <laughs> it has a different ring. So I go down to the chief of police station. And again, I took Tommy with me. And I walked in and I said, I said, Your Honor, he said, Reverend, what are you doing out there in that tent? He said, there have been a lot of complaints. I said, well, I said, here's a young man right here. I said, I want him to uh, talk to you for a moment. And Tommy gave that chief of police his testimony how God had delivered him from heroin and LSD and all of that. And I watched that chief of police. He looked the part, folks. He, Big burly like this, big old hand sitting there staring at us, you know. Got his cigar. But there was something that came through from the two of us to him. He had never, ever felt before. And his hands began to shake. And when Tommy got through with his testimony, I said, Your Honor, that's what we're doing out there. I said, because let me tell you something. You could not help him. His parents couldn't help him. Society couldn't help him. The school system couldn't help him. But Jesus delivered him. And that's what we're doing. It so shook him up, he said, Reverend, you need to go right now. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send cop cars every night. We'll patrol the air. We'll protect you in your meeting. We had police protection every night in that tent revival for the whole tent revival. I'm telling you, folks, if you just hang on to Jesus, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He will not disappoint you. He will come to your rescue. So... In that church, one Sunday morning, there was a very fine-looking young woman, maybe about 25 or 30, that walked in, distinguished-looking. She sat down in the back of the church, a little church on Webster Street, and uh, she wept in the song service. I had not seen her before. 
I had not seen her from door-to-door canvassing we had done. Nobody in my congregation seemed to recognize her. So at the end of the service, I said to her, I walked up to her and I said, Ma'am, how is it that you are here today? We're so glad to have you. She said, Reverend, I was walking this morning on the sidewalk, down the sidewalk, past this church. And she said, as I was walking in the sidewalk, there was a river of light that was flowing toward me on the sidewalk. She said, I began to, I'm telling you folks, there are areas we've not entered into, but you've got to be open to this. You can't scoff at it and mock it. You've got to be open to this. But if we will open ourselves to these things, we are headed for some of the greatest experiences of our entire apostolic Christian lives. She said, I began to walk into that river of light. She said, Reverend, I follow that river of light. It turned sharply and went up the steps onto, onto the, into the doorway of your church. She said, that river of light was coming from beneath the door of this church, flowing down the steps, down the sidewalk. She said, I followed that river of light into this church. If you ever get a hold of what I'm talking about, church will become the most exciting thing you do all week long. Church should not be an obligatory thing. Sister Varnum, church should not be an obligatory thing. This is the most exciting thing we do all week long. If you agree with that, would you just shout a little thanks to the Lord? This is the most exciting thing. This is the most exciting thing that we do all week long and the thing that makes this so exciting is that when you get here it is so exciting somebody we're about to enter the courts of god we're going to go through the doors of that church we're about to meet jesus somebody's going to get the holy ghost someone's going to get delivered someone's going to get healed there's going to be a demonstration of the spirit of god and power this is the most exciting thing you can walk into i can hardly wait to see what god's going to do this morning i can hardly wait to see what god's going to do tonight that's that that's our attitude that should be our attitude Jesus. So through the years that I pastored there, I also did some evangelistic work. And I went to a church, one, a church, an apostolic church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was pastored by Mom and Pop Williams. I knew both of them before they passed away. They were powerfully used by God. Powerfully used by God. And these people did not believe in going to doctors. They didn't even take an aspirin. I knew that when I went there to preach for them. But I went. It was amazing. In that revival, this was back in the early 70s, there were like 72 that got the Holy Ghost. 50 were baptized in Jesus' name. A beauty queen came from Florida. One came from California. The news of that revival spread everywhere across the country. In that revival, I saw something. John Williams, who was the son, called me one Sunday afternoon before church. He said, Brother Stone King, one of our teenage girls here in the church was in the pantry today on a stepladder, and she fell off the ladder, and she's broken her arm, and the bone's coming through the flesh. We got to pray for her at the beginning of the service. So I hurried, I got to church, there were about five or six hundred people there. And um, she was on the front row, eyes were swollen, she'd been crying, and it, it, was just, it was just awful to look at what had happened to her arm. And uh, he, John asked her to come up, and he opened this little bottle of oil, and he anointed her with oil, and we prayed. I didn't close my eyes on this, this one. I didn't do it. I wanted to see. And we prayed in Jesus' name. 
and I'm not exaggerating, I watched that bone withdraw back into her arm and the hole closed over. I watched it with these eyes. And when she saw that, the girl went, ah, and took off dancing. That's how the service began. That's not how the service ended. That's how it began. <laughs> so Pop Williams came down with cancer of the nose. And I knew that we all knew that he would not go to a doctor, and he didn't. And the cancer ate away in his face until this whole, the nose was gone. It was just an open, uh, terrible uh, sore. But he became very weak. And um, I loved him because he was such a tremendous man of God. He lived what he preached. And Mom Williams, she was, she was, she was a genius. She was absolutely... Her teaching was some of the greatest I've ever heard. I always went to Sunday morning to hear her teach because there was no one like her. And um, Pop became so bad that I was there at one occasion, and because um, I went every year, <clears throat> and he was in a wheelchair and he couldn't really move around that much, but I was in their home. We had had dinner there after the morning service, and I went over to Pop and I said to him, as he was in the wheelchair, I said, Pop, I want you to pray for me. And I knelt down on my knees in front of him in the wheelchair and I said, Pop, I just want you to lay your hands on me and pray for me. And he laid his hands on me and began to pray. It was, it was really something. While I was praying, leaning over, listening to him and he was praying for me, I felt two hands on my back. And when I stopped, he stopped praying and I got up, it was Sister Williams, his wife, Mary. And she said, Brother Strong King, I had a vision when I had a hold of your back. She said, I saw you walking on a path. She said, but there was light on that path. She said, but I noticed something. Along the path, the edges, there were stones. She said, but in among the stones, she said, there were flowers. So she said, you'll always have light on your pathway. She said that there will be stones, but there will be flowers. It's come to pass exactly as she said. There have been stones along the path, but there have also been flowers. You are the flowers. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm alive because of you. I'm living for you. I'm not supposed to be here. But I have defied all medical science. I told the, I told the United Nations that. That particular message, that seven and a half hour address I gave to the General Assembly of the United Nations, I just got word of this last year. At this point, over 54 million people have viewed that worldwide. So we have reached the world with Acts 238 in less than eight minutes. That's never been done before. People, we're at the end. We're at the end. Jesus is about to come. Something is about to happen. Something is trying to happen. Something wants to happen that has never, ever happened before. If you are excited about that and you want it, I think we ought to throw our hands in the air and just welcome this move of God that is upon us in this hour.
The reason that I feel so keenly about talking to you like this is because I've been coming here for a number of years and I, I love you people. I love the Varnums, this church. You people are precious and wonderful people. And you've got, to, you've got it all together. You really do. You've got the doctrine together. You've got the holiness together. You, you've got the music. You've got it all together here. But I know that God is wanting to get you into another level beyond where you are. That's why I'm talking to you like this. Because if God will do these things for me, he will do them for you. I'm not better than you. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not impressed with myself, but I'm very impressed with Jesus. There is no one like him. There never has been. There never will be again. He's worth shouting for, dancing for, loving, living for, worshiping him. Oh, I preached in James Kilgore's church for 30 years. Every year I went there. Some incredible things happened during the years I was there preaching. People got, a lot of deaf ears were opened, a lot of healings. There were hundreds that got the Holy Ghost through the years. But there was one thing that happened there that was just staggering to me. They had a photographer in the service, and there'd be 12 to 1,500 people there uh, in the evening services on Sunday and the morning services. So this photographer was over here at the end of this, pretty much near the end of the altar service. Uh, people were still standing in the audience. They had their hands raised, worshiping God. And this photographer with the camera took a picture, a whole view of the entire area. And when they got done with it, and I didn't know this until they came running, they came running and said, Brother Stone King, look, look. I said, what, what do you mean? She said, look at this picture. Over here, every place where people had their hands in the air worshiping, there were flames of fire above their heads. Over here, there were some people that were tired and they had sat down, but there was a few over here that still had their hands in the air, standing, worshiping God. Above every individual in that photograph, where they had their hands in the air, worshiping God, there were flames of fire. People, if you could see what happens when you worship God, it would change your entire approach to God. That's it. Just worship for a moment. Let your voice out. Jesus, I hear the sound of the rushing mighty wind in this place. I hear the crackle of cloven tongues of fire in this place. This happened in Brother T.W. Barnes' church in Minden, Louisiana. Brother Barnes and I were friends. I met him within hours after I got the Holy Ghost. And um, he was like a dad to me. He really was. 
and we were great and wonderful friends. <clears throat> so he told me things that he didn't always tell others. And one of the things that happened in his church, and he was a prophet of God, there's no doubt about it. He told me that in his church, in Mid Louisiana, there was a young mother there with children, and she lived in a house by herself with those two children. And um, a tornado was coming through. Her house was in direct line of that pathway of that tornado. And she was alone by herself in her house, and there was no way to get out and get anywhere. She was just there. So what she did was, the storm was coming, she could hear it. She was in the direct path, her house was in the direct path. She took a chair, she took those two little children, put them on the chair. She reached up and unpinned her long, uncut hair. Leaned over those two children and let that hair down over them and began to worship God. That storm came to her house, split, went around the house and continued the destruction. That was confirmed to me by some older saints in the church. They came and told me, they said, Brother Stone King, there was no doubt about it. It was a total miracle of God. The power of God that is upon us. The things of God that God wants to do. I was great friends with Brother and Sister Molly and Bill Thompson. They were missionaries to Columbia, South America. They were, they're absolutely apostles to that country. There was nothing like it. They had such an effect on Colombia, South America, with the converts they made. The Pope of Rome came there to reestablish the Catholic Church. That's how powerful this Holy Ghost is. I said to a Roman Catholic woman in my area once, she was just not interested in my testimony, not interested in anything I was having to say. So I thought, well... And nothing to lose, everything to gain. I'll pull back both hammers and fire. So I did. I said, lady, remember one thing. The next time you kneel before that statue of Mary, if she could come alive, she'd grab you by your ugly head and pray you through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost because she had it. And she did. This is our heritage. This is who we are. We're the only people in the world. We're the only Christian group in the world that can go all the way back to 33 AD. No one else can go back that far. The Roman Catholic Church can only go back to about 150 AD. They cannot bridge the gap between 150 and 33. But we can. We go all the way back because we are the originals. We are the originals. I can here tell you today that when God gave birth to the church, he did not give birth to the Roman Catholic Church. He did not give birth to the Episcopalian Church. He did not give birth to the Baptist Church or the Lutheran Church or the Presbyterians. He did not give birth to the, to the Mormons. He did not give birth to the Jehovah's Witnesses. He gave birth to this apostolic tongue talking baptized in Jesus' name church. This is the only church he gave birth to. It is the only church that he embraces. I was witnessing to a Roman Catholic priest once, and again, he wasn't interested in what I was saying either. I was trying to get him to come to school, to the church where I went in ABI. To hear. I said, the music, you'll love the music. He wasn't interested. He wasn't interested in anything that I was saying. But he had a Bible in his hand. I said, may I see your Bible? He said, yes, of course. So, I turned to Acts chapter 2.
Verse 38. I read to him, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the God are. God call, call. I said, Now, you are a Roman Catholic. He said, Yes. I said, If Peter was your first pope, right? He said, Yes. I said, You're sure of that? Oh, yes, he was our first pope. I said, well, this is where your first pope preached, and I read it again. I said, where did you people get off the track? He said, I don't know. I said, you better find out. And that's exactly what we ought to be doing. We ought to challenge these people. They don't have the truth. We've got the truth. This is that. Another that is not coming. This is that. God, we've got resurrection power inside of us. We've got the Spirit of God inside of us. We've got the knowledge of God inside of us. We're not just human beings. We're not just mortal people. We've got the Spirit of the living God inside of us. I've had some unusual things happen. I just walked by a man in a service where I went one night, down the middle aisle, got there a few minutes late. There was just a man in a black suit with his back to me. I, I, didn't, I didn't know why. Look, if you spend so much time asking why, or I'm not sure, you've already missed it. If you feel to do something, do it. If it doesn't work, we'll cover for you. But just do it. We've made a few mistakes. We've got room for a few mistakes. But I'll tell you, he who has never made a mistake has never done a blasted thing in this life, I never will do anything. So, as I was walking by, I just reached over and touched him. That's all I did and walked on. That man had a serious back injury that they couldn't help, they couldn't fix. He was healed instantaneously when I just touched him. Jesus knew who he was, what he needed, and I've got the power inside of me to do it. And you've got the power inside of you to do it. <clears throat> I was it because of the times one year I, all I did was I just walked by a preacher I got about 10 steps beyond him I was on the edge of the platform and the preacher yelled he said brother Stone King come back I said what he said I was born with one leg shorter than the other one he said when you walk by me this leg just grew as long as the other one he, I mean you understand the power that's inside of us? You understand what could begin to happen? Oh, that something is trying to happen right here. Brother Hadamal, that's in your church. That's in this church here. That's in, that's in your church. No matter what your, what your pastor it is, who you are here today, that thing is trying to operate in your church, but you've got to be open to it. You've got to open the door to it. Forget your traditions. Forget the program. Scrap the program. When the Holy Ghost comes in, drop it all and just climb over the pews and lay hands on them and get involved with the moving of the Spirit. Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost will do more in seconds than we'll do in years counseling and trying to help people to do what's right. If you believe that, clap again and just worship the Lord for a moment. Oh, uh, I was talking about the Thompsons in Columbia, South America. They told me that <clears throat> one morning to their home, the little place they lived in, there was a knock on the door. Brother Thompson opened the door and there was a leprous woman there. Her body was covered with scales of leprosy. And this woman, she, when she slept at night, when she got up in the morning, the sheet would be covered with blood and scales from the leprosy. There was no hope. But walking along the street, she had found a tract that was from their little church. 
She picked up that track and she followed that address until she got to the address. And when she knocked on the door, Brother Thompson opened the door and she said to him, I read this. I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. So he took her to the little church they had. And all they had was just a, like a tank, a, like a horse tank or something, a trough. And in order to baptize her, he had to get into the baptistry with her. Well, when he got in the baptistry and baptized her in Jesus' name, she came out of the water speaking with tongues. But when he got out, there were scales that had come off her body, and they were clinging to his pants legs. And he had to walk all the way home from there before he could get those trousers changed and get rid of those scales that had clung to him from that baptismal water. But the next morning... When that leprous woman woke up and got up and looked back at the sheet, there was no blood and there were no scales. She ran into the streets screaming, I have been healed. I have been healed. I have been healed. They baptized the entire village. That's what we need is the demonstration of the Spirit of God in power. I've said this before. If it gets noised abroad out there that the blind can come here and walk out seeing, that the deaf can come here and begin to hear, that the cancer disappears, that the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. People, you never, this building's not going to hold what's coming. This building will not hold what is coming because they out there don't have what we've got a hold of. They cannot compete with what you've got a hold of because there is only one gospel. There is only one gospel. There is only one gospel repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost I'm one of them I'm one of them I'm one of them you ought to be shouting I'm one of them well, I'm one of them people we are one of them that goes all the way back to 33 AD if you've got the Holy Ghost let the Holy Ghost speak through you right now just let the Holy Ghost speak through you There is something powerful on you right now as believers. Take the hand of the person next to you, begin to pray that the Holy Ghost that's on you, the anointing that you feel, will go to them. When you do, something will begin to explode because these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, in my name. They shall cast out devils, they shall speak with their tongues, they shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They, believers, shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall recover, they shall recover. Miracles of healing right now. Miracles of healing are taking place right now. It's happening. People are being healed. People are being healed of cancer right now. There are people being healed of cancer right now in this place. There are heart conditions that are disappearing in the name of Jesus. Because, because, because he is a healer. And the healer is in the house. Ah! Yeah. 
If, if you've been healed and you know you've been healed, you ought to come into the aisle. You ought to come down front and just jump up and down. If the pain is gone out of your body, and I command all pain in anybody's body here today to disappear right now in the name of Jesus, standing upon the word of God, the power of the name of Jesus. That's it. The healer is in the house. The healer is in the house. His name is Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. Right there. In the name of Jesus. By the authority of the word of God. By the power of the name of Jesus. That's it, that's it, that's it. Everybody get a hold of somebody. These signs shall follow them that believe. This place is packed with believers. Packed with believers. Jesus. receiving the Holy Ghost.
bring Mark down to you? Yes. I know that you can hear me, so you don't have to stop praying, but this is how it was in the book of Acts when they got together. This is the kind of force and power that they worship with. That's why when they prayed, the place was shaken. Something has been shaken in this entire area today. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about it. I know for sure there were people here today who have been healed of cancer. I get phone calls, I get texts from time to time that people have just been in the audience where I've been preaching. I never called them out, never prayed for them, and they were healed of cancer. People, when you walk through those doors back there, you walk into the most powerful radiation room on planet Earth. I don't care what the doctor told you, I don't care what the prognosis is or the diagnosis. When you come into the presence of God like this, the Holy Ghost can burn out cancer cells just like that, and there are people who have been healed of cancer in this service here today. There were some of you that walked in here with things that you're walking out without. You came in here with things that would not have come to surface for another six months or a year, but because you came to the house of God and you lifted your voice in praise and worship to Him, those things have disappeared from your body. People, we're at the end. This is revival. This is revival. This is what it's all about. I can tell you that outside this area, there is the biggest, most fierce battle raging in the spirit world. There is a battle raging in the spirit world unlike anything that I've ever felt or be able to touch in the 54 years I've had the Holy Ghost because the devil knows his days are numbered. He knows that Jesus is coming. So the heaviness that you feel is not you. It's coming from the outside trying to get in because there's a battle around us. I feel right now like we ought to absolutely cripple, destroy, and and annihilate that battle that rages around us by the power that is in this place, by the power of the name of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Jesus. One more time, just let your voice out. Whatever you feel like doing. I do not know, I do not know who all of you are, but I can tell you something right just, just there. We, we tore a hole in the canopy of darkness over this area. Something has let go, something has let loose. But I'm telling you, if you are a pastor, if you're a man of God or an evangelist, I don't know who you are, but you people know who each other is and who each other, who, who you are. So get a hold of some preacher next to you and pray. Just lay hands on them that God will protect them from the forces of darkness. Preachers are under terrible battles in this hour. They are, they are just raging. There's a battle raging against men of God and women of God. Get a hold of a pastor. Pray that God will put a hedge around him, that no human spirit can penetrate, that no force of darkness can penetrate. That's it. That's it. We've got to protect our men of God in the name of Jesus. I cover you with the name of Jesus. I cover you with the blood of Jesus.
How many of you know you've had a miracle of one kind or another in your body today? If there is pain gone, something has disappeared, something has changed, just lift your hands, wave them to the Lord for a moment. There are all kinds of things that have happened here today in the name of Jesus because this is apostolic. This is what it's supposed to be in the name of Jesus. I pray you'll never be the same again, that this church will explode like never before into daughter works everywhere. The news will get out everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I know that we have prayed for each other, but I want you to throw your hands in the air and pray for yourself for just a moment that God will use you more mightily than you've ever dreamed he would that the anointing that is here will be upon you that they will become your purpose it will become your personal possession that's it pray for yourself God in the name of Jesus of Nazareth You are touching God. You are definitely touching God. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Until the raka teke shata ka shata ka. He at all the raka shata ya the raka. Until the raka teke shata. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost is here. Holy Ghost is still working. If you want to stay and pray, please feel free to do so. For those of you that want to go eat, dinner is prepared. Tonight there is no evening service. Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Go to your church. Have a mighty move of God. And if you're able, and if you want to, and your pastor is all for it, they're having church here at 2 o'clock. Final service. The, the meal after this service is for registered people at the conference only. God bless you in Jesus' name.